Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Stephen Roach, a senior fellow and senior lecturer with the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs and Yale School of Management. Mr. Roach has spent 28 years in senior positions at Morgan Stanley, the bulk of that time as chief economist and more recently as chairman of the firm's Asian businesses. In addition to his position at Yale, he remains the non-executive chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. Mr. Roach has long been one of Wall Street's most influential economists. His most recent book, The Next Asia, Opportunities and Challenges for a New Globalization, analyzes Asia's economic imbalances and the dangers of the region's dependence on Western consumers. Today we'll talk with Mr. Roach about the future of China and what it means for the global economy. Welcome, Mr. Roach. Good to see you, Marilyn. In the past 30 years or so, China has experienced unprecedented economic development. Let's talk about that for a little bit and if you can give us an overview of what has happened. Well, you go back 30 years ago, Marilyn, uh, China post-cultural revolution, the economy was on the brink of, of collapse. Mm -hmm. And then a series of reforms were um, instituted under the leadership of uh, Deng Xiaoping. And the economy is recorded on average about 10% growth a year for three decades, predominantly led by two key sectors, um, exports and export-led fixed investment. <coughs> and the, the growth rate has truly been spectacular. The increases in the standard of living, the income for the average Chinese has m moved up tenfold uh, over that period. No country has ever experienced a development miracle like that. The question that I raise and the question that I address in my new course at Yale, The Next China, is, is, is this model sustainable? And uh, my, my conclusion, which we can talk about in greater detail, is that there needs to be some big changes in China's approach to economic growth and development. Okay, and what are those changes? Well, the main change is that China has to figure out the policies that it needs to put in place to stimulate internal private consumption. The model, as it has um, uh, been evident over the past 30 years, is hugely dependent on not just China's own competitiveness in the global economy, but on the state of global demand. Mm -hmm. And in the aftermath of this devastating financial crisis, that's the big question mark that clouds the horizon. Consumers in America, Europe, Japan are going to be much less dynamic in supporting the external demand that underpins uh, the Chinese export machine. So lacking in that support from the broader global economy, China needs a new source of, of, of growth, and that growth has got to come from its 1.3 billion people in the form of a significant increase uh, in internal private consumption. Okay, you recently uh, wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times and um, y you know you cite some challenges um, for the US government and then also um, there are some tensions um, some some similar tensions uh, that are similar between the two countries let's talk about a little bit about that well uh, China's uh, the whipping boy for the post-crisis world especially uh, in in the US where we have a, a, a horrific uh, unemployment and underemployment problem that uh, involves between 16 to 17 percent of the entire American working age population. And for those um, uh, Americans who are still working, their wages adjusted for inflation have really not grown much for the median American worker in the last decade. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we have a, a, a pretty poisonous political climate in this country, and, and our politicians in Washington don't want to accept any responsibility uh, for these problems bearing down American middle class workers. So they blame globalization, they blame the trade deficit, they blame the biggest piece of our trade deficits with China, they conclude that China manipulates its currency, uh, and therefore we should put enormous pressure on China to revalue the RMB sharply higher, and if they don't, let's slap them with trade sanctions. This is the view in Washington. The U.S. House of Representatives enacted a bill that would um, uh, impose trade sanctions on China if it doesn't follow this recipe. And yet, unfortunately, I believe this whole analysis, this prescription, is dead wrong. 
It reflects America's unwillingness to look in the mirror and figure out what really causes the savings problem and what we must do as a nation to address that. Okay, so what do you think the United States should do and what do you think China should be doing um, in terms of working together to try and resolve these issues? Well, from the U.S. point of view, I, it's, it's not that difficult to figure out that, that we don't have just a China problem. If you look at our trade statistics last year, 2009, we had trade deficits with 90 countries. That's 9-0. <coughs> that means excluding China, we had deficits with 89 other countries. We have a multilateral trade imbalance, mm -hmm. not a bilateral trade problem. Simple math, simple economics tells you it's pretty logical that you don't fix a multilateral problem with a so-called bilateral fix. The reason we have a multilateral trade deficit in the United States is for one simple reason. We do not save. Lacking in saving, we must import surplus savings from abroad in order to grow and run huge uh, current account and multilateral trade imbalances to attract the capital. If we want to fix our trade problems with China or with the other 89 countries we run deficits with, we've got to figure out how to save again. And that means we've got to control our budget deficit eventually uh, and encourage American families to save the old-fashioned way, which they gave up doing during the era of uh, excess when we saved out of asset bubbles. So these are our problems. These are not China's problems. In the same sense, China must be responsible for its uh, surplus saving, which has certainly played a role in creating major global imbalances, and it must put in place policies to stimulate internal private consumption. I wrote about that in detail uh, in the New York Times. It's very sp specific recommendations as to what I think uh, China needs to do. Well, and what, what are those recommendations? Well, you have to start with the idea that um, China's consumption share of its GDP is only about 36% right now. And amazingly enough, that's about half the, the ratio uh, that uh, exists uh, in the U.S. So, you know, we consume too much, they consume too little. There are three things that need to be done explicitly uh, by the Chinese to boost internal private consumption. First and foremost, they have to invest in the social safety net. This is social security, private pensions, unemployment insurance, medical insurance. They do that, they will draw down the excesses of fear-driven precautionary saving. Number two, they have to provide a lot of support to rural income. Still, 750 million Chinese live at relatively impoverished levels in the rural countryside. Mm -hmm. So aggressive tax policy, rural land reform, IT-enabled connectivity, and policies that encourage rural urban migration need to be emphasized. And third and finally, uh, believe it or not, China, despite all its growth, doesn't generate enough jobs, and that's because most of the growth is driven by a manufacturing sector uh, where you boost productivity by substituting uh, uh, machines for people. China has a very small and undeveloped services sector, which is a much more labor-intensive endeavor of economic activity, and it needs to promote policies that would encourage the expansion of industries like wholesale trade, retail trade, uh, health care, mm -hmm. uh, hospitality, uh, leisure, domestic transportation. You put those policies in place, and I'm very optimistic that China will do that in its upcoming 12th five-year plan to be enacted early next year, and the consumption share will move up. The idea you can achieve that by uh, a currency revaluation on the part of China, I think is ludicrous and far-fetched at best. Okay. Do you think that um, currency reevaluation will happen though nevertheless? The Chinese have been, um, since the middle of 2005, been allowing their currency, the renminbi, or some people refer to it as the, as the yuan, mm -hmm. to move up gradually vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. Uh, it's up uh, since the middle of 2005, a five-year period, about 23 percent against the dollar. By the way, when American congressmen first started bashing China back in, 19, uh, in 2005, they said that the Chinese renminbi was 25 percent undervalued against the dollar. The dollar is up 23 of those 25 points. Mm. They are still saying uh, that uh, the, the renminbi is 25 percent undervalued. I think their models are stuck. They need to sort of reboot the machine and figure out uh, a new way to calculate these so-called valuation metrics.
Okay. Um, in looking at China again, is there are there any specifics that China can do to help um, a struggling United States? There's a huge one. If China succeeds in implementing the policies that mm -hmm. I just enumerated, and they boost their internal private consumption as a share of U.S. GDP, that is an enormous opportunity for American companies to export into. China is America's third largest export market today. The Obama administration, uh, desperate for new sources of economic growth, has identified exports as a main target for economic growth. They feel strongly that exports have the potential to double over the next five years, and this would create uh, millions of new jobs. I agree with that. I think that's a, 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 a very ambitious but realistic target. But how are we going to double export markets if we slap trade sanctions uh, on the economy that is our third largest export market? Most likely, they would put reciprocal sanctions on American goods sold there. If we encourage China to boost internal private consumption, then we've got a shot to compete into that market, our third largest export market, and grow our way back to prosperity rather than try to bash China as a recipe for prosperity. Uh, there's no way we're going to achieve those goals if we uh, impose trade sanctions on China. But if we encourage uh, China and put pressure on them to open up their markets and grow their internal uh, demand, that's a, an extraordinary competitive opportunity for the United States. Okay. And let's <coughs> look at um, the next Asia five, ten years down the road. What does it look like? To me, the next Asia will be a more balanced Asia. Mm -hmm one that derives much greater support from Asia's most precious asset, its three and a half billion uh, consumers. The Asian uh, growth machine for most of the last uh, 30, 40 years has been export-led, hugely dependent on demand in the developed world. That demand is now tired. It needs a rest. That's what the crisis uh, is telling you. And so it's, it's time for Asia, given the amazing success that the region has accomplished, especially China, uh, in figuring out uh, and how to crack the code of economic development, it's time for the, the region to really uh, put in place the types of policies that I have elaborated on that would stimulate its own internal markets. Asia will then be a more balanced economy. Uh, it will uh, uh, be a, uh, an, an economy that derives much greater support from its services sector, less reliant on natural resources. As a result, less of a polluter uh, in the world, and this will be important for uh, a, a global uh, um, village that is focused on climate change uh, and cleaner world GDP growth. Very good. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. It's a pleasure to be with you, Meryl. For more information about Professor Roach and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you very much.